Hello students, welcome to Eat Paatshala. My name is Arjinder Kaur and I am an assistant professor in postgraduate government college sector 11 Chandigarh. In this module, we will discuss India's relationship with the regional organizations namely ASEAN, SARC and EU. In the current global politics and the emerging trends that we see in the politics today, the importance of regions is increasing day by day. In such a scenario, it becomes very important for a country like India to have cordial relationships with these regional organizations to have more say at the politics at the world stage. SARC, which stands for South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, is one of such important organizations. ASEAN, which is Asia Association of Southeast Asian Countries, Nations, is also another such important organization which is of very much importance to our country. And third, European Union is again a very important economic union of 28 countries of Europe. All of these three uh, regional organizations play a very important role in terms of economic, political and strategic ties with our country. And hence, it becomes imperative for us to understand how India is engaging with these three countries separately and with these regional organizations separately at the world stage. This module will discuss the relationship of India with these organizations one by one. Objectives This module will apprise the readers about the India's relations with SARC, ASEAN and EU. India is the main player in the SARC activities. India has maintained sound political and economic relations with SARC countries. India's Look East policy concentrates on maintaining good political, economic and strategic relations with ASEAN countries. As far as EU is concerned, India is doing good efforts to establish and maintain economic, political and strategic relations with the countries of EU. This module evaluates various dimensions of India's relations with the countries of SARC, ASEAN and EU in detail. And finally, important questions and list of suggested readings is also included in this module. India-SARC relations SARC has the potential to vastly improve the lives of its 1.5 billion citizens, nearly one-fourth of all humanity, particularly the inhabitants of its largest member, India. While the gesture of inviting SARC leaders to his swearing-in ceremony by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2014 might be considered symbolic, it provided the necessary impetus in bringing SARC to the forefront of India's foreign policy lexicon. Since then, several measures have reinforced the government's res resolve to force closer strategic ties with countries in the region. High-level visits to Nepal, Bangladesh and Bhutan not only signal their importance in India's foreign policy priorities but have also laid the groundwork for stronger and more substantive cooperation. Similarly, out-of-the-box thinking on avenues for cooperation including the proposal for a SARC satellite and a center for good governance signal the government's intention to play a proactive role in providing a leadership and governance structures to a region characterized by fragmentation and tension. Formation of SARC The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, that is SARC, is an organization of South Asian nations established on December 8, 1985. Its headquarters are in Kathmandu, Nepal. The very first proposal for establishing a framework for regional integration in South Asia was made by the President of Bangladesh, Zia Rahman, on May 2, 1980. The governments of Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka formally adopted this charter providing for the promotion of social, economic and cultural development within the South Asian region and also for friendship and cooperation with other developing countries. Its seven founding members were Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Bangladesh while Afghanistan joined the organization in 2007. Observer states include USA, Australia, China, Japan, South Korea, Myanmar, Mauritius, Iran and European Union. Meetings of heads of state are usually held on annual basis and meetings of foreign secret secretaries twice a year. Objectives of SARC The objectives of SARC as defined in its charter are as follows. One, to promote the welfare of the people of South Asia and improve their quality of life. 2. 
to accelerate economic growth, social progress and cultural development in the region by providing all individuals the opportunity to live in dignity and realize their full potential. 3. To promote and strengthen collective self-reliance among the countries of South Asia. 4. To contribute to mutual trust, understanding and appreciation of one another's problems. 5. To promote active collaboration and mutual assistance in the economic, social, cultural, technical and scientific fields. 6. To strengthen cooperation with other developing countries. 7. To strengthen cooperation among themselves in international forms on matters of common interest. And 8. To cooperate with international and regional organizations with similar aims and purposes. India's role in SARC. India's initial attitude towards SARC was lethargic and suspicious. It consequently played a limited role in the alliance, choosing instead to engage with its neighbours bilaterally based on reciprocity. However, as its economic position improved in the mid-1990s, India began to assume a greater role as a regional leader. The adoption of Gujral doctrine changed this attitude in a big way. The doctrine stemmed from the belief that India's stature on the world stage was closely tied to its relations with its neighbours. Subsequent governments, notably those led by Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh, continued to engage with India's neighbours in this spirit. During the SARC summit of 2007, India's external affairs minister Pranam Mukherjee in an address to a conference of parliamentarians from the SARC region declared India's readiness as the largest nation in the region to accept asymmetrical responsibilities including opening up her markets to her South Asian neighbours without insisting on reciprocity. The change in posturing notwithstanding, India hasn't been able to translate all of its promises into action. Studies find that the presence of a large economy often has positive externalities for smaller economies in the region. The International Monetary Fund finds However, that India's growth has had only a minuscule impact on the growth of its neighbours. The paltry level of intra-regional trade stems from the region being the least open in the world, but within the region, India remains the least open country with the lowest rate GDP ratio. Besides, SAC is still a long way from achieving even the most basic objective of a regional organisation, a no-war scenario among its members. Despite SAC's dismal past, the present government of Narendra Modi has boldly stroked new hope for the future of SARC. Modi is widely seen as a reformist prime minister who is expected to open up the economy and liberalize trade. In addition, agreements stemmed from vis visits to neighboring countries reveal a certain line of thinking, cooperation, particularly in infrastructure and energy, targeted at resolving shared problems. It is therefore logical that the government would seek similar opportunities to expand and deepen the engagement with SARC. Modi's ambition for SARC, however, is confronted by external and internal challenges. Externally, the continuing tensions with Pakistan, the uncertainty over Afghanistan and the role of outside actors, notably China, pose threats to revitalizing SARC. Internally, the limited capacity of the Indian state, particularly the minuscule size of the foreign service, as well as the ability to engage key state governments as stakeholders in foreign policy, are also challenges that need to be addressed. Despite these challenges, or indeed because of them, cooperation through SARC on infrastructure, energy, water, trade, climate change mitigation, higher education, health care, terrorism, and even military cooperation would contribute to India's twin goals of development and stability in the neighbourhood. Constraints in SARC There are some serious constraints which are not allowing South Asian cooperation to develop. Some of these hurdles are as under. Mistrust, mutual security, perceptions and hostility among members. India-Pakistan rivalry. Fear of Indian domination member countries. Civilizational clash unstable and weak financial position of SARC members. But despite all these barriers, SARC members remain a hope for almost one-fourth of the world population residing in South Asia for better understanding among the nations of this region and regional integration. India-Asian relations The civilization and cultural links between India and Asian countries date back thousands of years and are still visible today in their architecture and religion. 
but ideological differences precluded the development of close political ties for most of the Cold War. It was only after the collapse of the Soviet Union that Indian Prime Minister Narasimha Rao decided to engage Southeast Asia by initiating a new chapter as Look East Policy, an Indian foreign policy paradigm as part of a broader effort to liberalize the country's economy in an increasingly globalized world. The Look East Policy portrays a strategic shift in India's vision of the world and India's position in the rapidly developing global economy. Since the inception of the policy, India and ASEAN have embarked upon multiple bilateral, regional and sub-regional initiatives for the flourishing and pursuit of the policy. India and ASEAN relations can be studied under the following headings. 1. Economic relations 2. Political relations and 3. Strategic relations Economic relations The Look East policy gave a tremendous boost to economic ties between India and countries of ASEAN. A number of institutional mechanisms and provisions have been put up in place to promote economic exchanges in the fields of trade, foreign direct investment and joint ventures. Trade The trade relations between India and countries of ASEAN region, though quite old, were not quantitatively significant up to the end of the Cold War. But these relations got momentum after the end of the Cold War in 1990s. During 1990s, the reason for development in bilateral trade between India and ASEAN was the positive signs shown by the then Indian government in 1990s to liberalize the economy and move towards fewer government controls, leading to a more competitive and open economy. The Look East policy made positive impact on India's trade with ASEAN in value terms. Since then, there is considerable development in bilateral trade between these two regions. The deepening of its ties between India and ASEAN is reflected in the continued buoyancy in trade figures. Presently, India-ASEAN trade has reached to the figure of US dollars 70 billion in 2012. During 2011-12, India-ASEAN trade has shown 41% growth. At India-ASEAN summit held in New Delhi on 20-21 December 2012, a trade target of US dollar 100 billion has been set for 2015. Foreign Direct Investment Like trade, foreign direct investment during 1980s and 1990s played important role in shaping rapid economic development of the ASEAN. Singapore was the most favorable investment destination among developing countries. The principal attractions of ASEAN were rapid industrialization, export orientation, policy of openness, progressive and positive attitude towards foreign investment. On the basis of number of investments approved, the cumulative ASEAN number of FDI and technology agreements in India during 1991-2002 to 2002 has been 866, that is about 4.6% of total agreements which India entered with all other countries. Out of these, 542 were financial and 324 were technical agreements. Singapore's share among ASEAN 5 total agreements with India was about 65% followed by Malaysia 17% and Thailand with 12%. Philippines and Indonesia's share in these approvals were 5 and 2% respectively. However, India's overall FDI in ASEAN was insignificant and most of that was concentrated in Singapore specifically in infrastructure, IT sector and petrochemicals. Joint Ventures India-Asian investment in the form of joint ventures started in 1960s. These are of industrial as well as commercial nature and are mainly concentrated in Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore and Indonesia. Now India is 18th biggest investor in Indonesia. India-Indonesia joint ventures are mainly in the areas of petrochemical plants and township developments. Malaysian joint ventures are mainly concentrated in infrastructure especially in highway development. In 2010, Malaysian companies were engaged in 28 projects worth US dollar 1.8 billion in India and over 10 Indian companies were operating in Malaysia in near about 60 joint ventures. Singapore and India were having nearly 50 joint ventures in 1995. Free Trade Agreement in Service and Investment was signed at ASEAN India Summit held at None, Cambodia on 19 November 2012. Political relations. To forge deeper bilateral relations, India signed various agreements with individual countries of ASEAN. 
डबल टैक्सेशन अवॉइडेंस एग्रीमेंट 1994, कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव इकोनॉमिक कोऑपरेशन एग्रीमेंट 2005, एंड मेमोरेंडम ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग फॉर आर्मी टू आर्मी एक्सरसाइज टू आर सम ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट एग्रीमेंट साइंड विद सिंगापुर शोइंग इंडियन कल्चर एंड क्यूजीन थ्रू इंडिया इवनिंग होस्टेड इन इंडियन शो इन सिंगापुर फ्रॉम जनवरी फोर्टीन सिक्सटीन टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेल्व इज ऑल्सो एन एविडेंस ऑफ सॉलिड बायोलेट्रल पोलिटिकल रिलेशन ऑफ इंडिया एंड सिंगापुर एग्रीमेंट ऑन कोऑपरेशन इन साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी नाइनटीन नाइनटी एट ट्रेड एग्रीमेंट टू थाउजेंड एग्रीमेंट सी ई सी ए जुलाई टू थाउजेंड इलेवन cultural exchange program for 2010 to 13 are a few of many other agreements which are signed between india and malaysia india has also inked some agreements with thailand to name a few are agreement on peaceful uses of atomic energy 2000 framework agreement for establishment of free trade area in 2003 and memorandum of understanding on cooperation in the area of renewable energy 2007 to conduct and maintain smooth political relations dialogue mechanism was also evolved which encompasses four areas asean post ministerial conference asean india senior officials meeting asean india joint cooperation committee asean india working group india was granted status of regional dialogue partner in january 1992 in four areas as a result of the improvement in its political relations in these countries later on India's position was elevated to full dialogue partner in December 1995. Going on this track on strategic front, India was also made a member of ASEAN Regional Forum on July 23, 1996. Strategic relations. The broader agenda of phase 2 look east policy also focuses on security cooperation including joint operations to protect sea lanes and pooling resources in the war against terrorism. the military contacts and joint exercises india launched with asean started on a low key basis in the 1990s are now expanding into full fledged defense cooperation and it has also reached to the level of training of defense personnel and trade in military equipments malacca straits is the main point of maritime security cooperation between india and asia, malaysia in recent times India security cooperation with Singapore dates back to mid 1960s however it was not until 2003 that a defense cooperation agreement was signed between the two countries this agreement led to setting up of an India Singapore defense policy dialogue a joint working group on security between India and Thailand was set up in 2002 and was institutionalized in 2003 India and Philippines signed memorandum of understanding for defense cooperation in 2006 during president dr apj abdul kalam's visit to philippines asean india defense relationship can be understood at two levels first the bilateral defense ties between individual asean states and india second the multilateral collaboration between asean as a regional bloc with india as well as involvement of asean member states in various defense activities those are highly multilateral in character During second India ASEAN summit in October 2003 Asian Treaty of Amity and Cooperation was signed by India and joint declaration on cooperation in combating international terrorism was adopted During third India ASEAN summit prime minister signed agreement on India ASEAN partnership for peace progress and shared prosperity Of watershed significance in Southeast Asia India multilateral defense cooperation was India's participation in the inaugural of ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting plus 8 ADMM plus 8 forum held for the first time in Hanoi in October 2010 at the ADMM plus 8 India was represented by Defense Minister AK Antony at the India ASEAN special commemorative summit held in New Delhi on 20th and 21st December 2012 participating nations underlined the need for cooperation on maritime security a move that comes amid growing tension between china and other claimants in the potentially oil and gas rich south china sea hence india asian engagement that began with a strong economic emphasis has now also become increasingly strategic in its content political dialogue between the two has grown consultations in regional forums have intensified and defense and counter terrorism cooperation have expanded thus india and asean could succeed in converging their respective vision 2020 and march together beyond the year 2020 by drafting shared asean vision 
India EU relations. Considered natural allies in a wide range of global issues by both parties, diplomatic relations between India and European Union were established in the early 1960s. Since the 1990s, cooperation between the two increased and their friendship and their relationship was institutionalized. A cooperation agreement signed in 1994 took the bilateral relationship beyond trade and economic cooperation. At the 5th India-EU summit held at The Hague in 2004, the relationship was upgraded to a strategic partnership. The two sides adopted a joint action plan in 2005, which was reviewed in 2008 that provided for strengthening dialogue and consultation mechanisms in the political and economic spheres enhancing trade and investment, and bringing people and cultures together. The relations between can be studied under the following heads. Political relations. The first India-EU summit took place in Lisbon in 28 June 2000 and marked the watershed in the evolution of the relationship. Since then, 12 annual summits have been held. The last one in New Delhi on 10th February 2012. The 12th summit was the first summit to be held in India after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. The 23rd India-EU ministerial meeting took place in Brussels on 30th January 2013. The then external affairs minister Salman Khurshid led the Indian delegation while EU side was led by High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy Baroness Catherine Ashton. Bilateral relations as well as international and regional issues of mutual interest were discussed at the meeting. The two ministers met again on 11 November 2013 in New Delhi in the margins of the 11th ASM Foreign Ministers Meeting hosted by India. Both sides have recently instituted foreign policy consultations at the level of secretaries. There is also a Delhi-based joint working group on consular issues. In addition, a high-level dialogue on migration and mobility has been instituted at secretary level between the Ministry of Overseas India Affairs and DG Home Affairs, the third round of which took place in New Delhi on 2nd July 2012. Economic Relations The EU as a bloc of 28 countries is India's largest regional trading partner, while India was EU's ninth largest trading partner in 2014. India's bilateral trade in the goods in 2014 was 72.52 billion euros as compared to 72.66 billion euros in 2013 and thus registered a marginal decline of 0.20% in 2013 as compared to 2013. Indian exports to the EU accounted to $37.07 billion euros during 2014 as compared to 36.84 billion euros in 2013 showing an increase of 1.03% while India's imports from EU in 2014 stood at 35.45 billion euros as compared to 35.82 billion euros in 2013 thereby reflecting a decline of 0.63%. The EU is one of the largest sources of foreign direct investment for India. FDI inflows from the EU to India were $5.48 billion Euros in 2012 and $4.3 billion Euros in 2013. Indian investments in EU were $1.4 billion Euros in 2013. The most important EU countries for FDI inflows into India in 2013 were Germany, UK, Italy, Sweden and Belgium. Strategic Partnership the European Security Strategy, December 2003, was the first EU document to mention strategic partnerships as kind of foreign policy tool. After working for over a year, the European Commission came out with a communication on an EU-India strategic partnership, June 2004, which proposed a series of strategic policy dialogues and strategic sectoral dialogues to streamline the architecture of the relationship. It proposed to develop a genuinely strategic partnership with India in four key areas. Cooperation, especially in multilateral four, on conflict prevention, the fight against terrorism and non-proliferation of weapons and mass destruction. A strengthened economic partnership through strategic policy and strategic dialogues. Development cooperation. Fostering intellectual and cultural exchange. Six weeks later, in a detailed 31-page response to the EC communication, the first ever Indian strategy paper on relations with an outside entity, New Delhi presented a number of proposals 
for enhancing more systematic interaction with the European Union. The strategic partnership was endorsed at the 5th India-EU Summit 2004. Two texts were negotiated. A new political declaration and a joint action plan divided into four sections. Politics, trade and investment, economic policy and cultural and academic matters. Covering issues of mutual concern were adopted at the next summit in September 2005. An implementation report on the working of strategic partnership was presented at Helsinki Summit October 2006, where it was agreed that an annual progress report on implementation of JAP would be presented. The 8th summit, November 2007, resolved to make an overall assessment of the JAP in 2008 and assess the ways and means to further upgrade the overall framework of EU-India relations. At the Marseille Summit, September 2008, a revised JAP was adopted, which added 40 odd new activities in four areas. Peace and comprehensive security, sustainable development, research and technology, and people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges. Let me conclude this model module by saying that regional integration in current times has become very significant and India also has been engaging itself with various regional organizations of the world. And in this module, we discussed India's relationship with SARC, ASEAN and European Union. When we talk about SARC, we see that India's relationship is not only important because of economic gains, but it is also important because of stability in the region and India is because of its relationship with the regional organization of SARC is able to achieve its twin goals. Twin goals, one of development and the other of having stability in the region. When it comes to the South Asian countries, we see that it is not only government to government relationship that has become important, but also the role of non-governmental organizations are playing very important role in maintaining close ties between India and countries of Southeast Asia. As we move on to the relationship between India and European Union, we say that a lot of foreign direct investment has been invited by the Indian state from the countries of European Union, which are helping in boosting the relationship between India and European countries. Thank you.